Welcome to the final press row of 2014. Joined by Zach Bowers, Aaron Matthews. Man, you're rolling up your sleeve. I am. I'm getting, He's getting excited. I mean, this is about to get intense. Todd Walker is on location in Alabama. So the Mark, Camellia Bowl. The Camellia Bowl, which we might talk about One of about what, 70 on. bowl games this year? You are correct. Music likes it as well. Mark Kuntz is here <laughs> as well. Let's start with uh, some high school basketball. This point of the season is always a little interesting because there's a break coming up where some of the uh, all the teams will get a little breather, so it's almost like two seasons for me. What are some of the surprises through the first two weeks of boys basketball? I think you'll get Bluffton. The yep. start they've jumped out to, uh, you know, a Bluffton team that I don't know if anybody's really expecting them to get off to this great start. I mean, they're four and zero. They're going to have some better challenges coming up, but uh, I, I would put them at the top of the list right now. I, I would agree with you as far as Bluffton, but I also would have to say. Um, how well the MAC has played in just in an overall scope of picture. Well, but three of the ten schools have yet to play <laughs> That's a game. Very I know. Now that is true, but just to see how well they've gotten out the shoot, and most notably would be St. Henry, and really to me was the emphasis of their win over your beloved Spencerville Bearcats, yeah. and it wasn't just a win; it was a dominant win um, by 25 points on opening night. And then Versailles getting Kyle Arns back last Friday night. He goes for a thousandth point. He scores 22 in the win over New Bremen. Uh, but just, you know, in, I would say Mac in general, but, you know, there's really, Bluffton by far would be the biggest surprise. And I would also have to say how well Shawnee has done yeah. as well. They're going to be a very scrappy team. We talked about them uh, off the offsuits of uh, the tip-off classic a week ago. And I think Shawnee could be another one of those teams that might have a little bit of a dog in the fight. And uh, when it comes to the WBL, they may not win it, but they're going to give teams good effort, I think. That's very true. Looking at uh, Shawnee and the Elida tip-off, definitely a lot of fight mm -hmm. in that team. I'd have to go, maybe not a big surprise, a little bit, the, the Jeff Jefferson Wildcats um, also 4-0 right now, along with their uh, counterparts in the NWC. Just because Trey Boston. Smith is scoring 40 points a game. Very true. It's a good way to get to 4-0. That's very yeah. true. So, again, like you mentioned, Mark, more challenges, bigger, better challenges to be had, uh, particularly this weekend. But... Um, a great start for the Jeff Cats. So you had Jefferson and Bluffton, both those schools in the NWC. This is a Mark Shine fact, so I can't take credit for this, but they're 16-9 and nine against non-conference teams. It's best of any league in the area. So the NWC has really impressed me early on, and I had Bluffton as well, just looking at, at what the Pirates have been able to do. So which is the next, which is the best non-conference game this weekend? I think without a doubt it's LCCOG Saturday night, guys. I mean, I mean, I looked at schedules earlier today and the last night and was just like, it could, when I saw the questions, I'm like, I don't know if there is. I mean, there's LCCOG, and then it seems like it's everybody else. Yeah, it's very true. I think what's going to be interesting with that LCCOG matchup is going to be how LCC tries to defend Noah Bromwich. Do they stick Jake Williams on him? Do they go with Dan Tez Walton? Do they do some sort of box and one on him? You, you know what you're getting out of OG with, with Bromwich, but – LCC is a little bit more deeper than, than OG. It's going to be a great matchup. We've seen how well these two teams have played against each other throughout the years in the postseason, and it very well could be another playoff preview. Well, I know another thing, too, with that matchup, and you brought it last year, it was Dan Walt. It could be him. It could be Jake Williams. I think it will probably be a combination of both. They might, they'll switch on and off. But I, going into this game, you know, I want to see from the LCC side of things, how does Josh Dixon do? as the lead guard going into a hostile yeah. environment. Because with all due respect to the Elida Tip-Off Classic, that was not a hostile mm -hmm. environment for LCC. They came in, pretty much ran roughshod over the entire tournament. Last week against Toledo Scott, he had a very good game, including a 35-footer to end the third quarter that banked off the glass and went in. How does Josh Dixon, as the junior point guard of this team, in his first major test, how does he handle that? And also Trey Cobbs coming off the dribble as quick as anybody in the area. How does Ottawa Glendorf try to counter with that? Well, I've got to say, watching Ottawa Glendorf this past weekend against Liberty Benton. Yes. Very impressive. Much, yes. much further progressed than I even anticipated, knowing that they probably had a lot of time to practice, not quite as deep in the, the football picture as they had liked, but they looked very impressive. And what I want to point out, what I would question with LCC after watching the light a tip off, the pressure that we know always comes from OG was incredible against Liberty Benton. Mm -hmm. Their full court pressure, their intensity on defense, of course, their extended bench that they always have. But it's going to be very interesting to see how LCC handles that pressure with the guards that they do have. I think that's a great point as well. But something, here's a stat about Ottawa Glendorf that very few people would even think of. This is the first time since, I believe, 
Dave Sweet was the head basketball coach at OG, that they had their full complement of soccer and football players on the first day of basketball when <laughs> they started in November. Wow, wow. that is interesting. Yeah. This LCC OG match, obviously the, the game that we're all looking forward to this week, rematch of the postseason matchup last year. Yep. When that happens, that's always interesting to me. I think the Titans, having lost in the postseason last year to the eventual state champs at LCC, maybe this means a little more to them. I know it's a different LCC team than was, was played last year. Do you think that factors in at all? Um, a little bit, I think it does. But you've also, on the flip side, you've got a different OG team as well. They lost a yeah. lot of senior leadership from a year ago. And obviously, you look at Noah Bromwich, and Noah is an excellent inside-out player. He prefers to face up, though, in, in his, more in his comfort zone outside. And I know in years past, LCC, when he's gone down low, has really banged on him. That's taken him out of his comfort zone. And you talked about the Liberty Benton game last week against uh, OG. My goodness, was I impressed with the mm -hmm. Titans. I knew that they were going to be good. I didn't expect them to be that good yeah. against LB. And I knew LB was down a little bit. But Ben Gherkin's going to have that team deep into the postseason yeah. as well, I think. Well, speaking of LB, I think that's another one of the interesting matchups on Saturday. LB travels to Bath, a Bath team that is coming off the loss to Bluffton in overtime. And they obviously got their WBL game on Friday. I think that's a non-conference game to look forward to. And also Jefferson and Kaleida. That's what I wanted to yes. throw out there. Yep. Jeff, Jeff Katz um, averaging 72 points a game. Kaleida more around the 50, as you would expect from there. Kind of the first test for, for both those teams, yeah. I think. Um, to see where they're really at. Caught a big win against Pandora Gilboa earlier in the week on a buzzer beating three. All right, to college hoops now. Ohio State has a matchup with UNC coming up, but their non conference schedule is iffy. And this is the Jim Beheim special. <laughs> coming from Syracuse, I see this all the time. <laughs> Syracuse never left New York State before February, really, before, you know, mid January. So do you think Ohio State needs to beef up their non conference? What's wrong with UMass, Lowell? <laughs> What's Some wrong with North teams, Carolina? Hey, my, high school JV, my high school JV coach was the head coach at UMass Lowell at one time. You got Colgate, you got High Point. <laughs> I mean, come on. This is a, a common complaint about the Ohio State schedule, but the fact of the matter is it's not going to change. They don't need it to change. As long as the Big Ten is as strong as it is, Ohio State understands that if they're a bubble team, the Big Ten strength of schedule will get them into the NCAA tournament, and that's what matters doesn't matter what you do in November and December. It's what you do in February and March. And as long as they keep on winning these games, which hasn't been as easy for some of the other Big Ten teams against them Patsies, they're not going to change the schedule. Thad Mata likes it the way it is. They try to get one marquee home game, one marquee road game, one marquee neutral site game. You can complain all you want about the, the Stony Points and – the Campbells and the Sacred Hearts, it's not changing there's as long as the Big Ten. There's some ifs that you got to take into consideration if the Big Ten continues in its path. And when you're talking about scheduling, what, how many years out in advance do they do this scheduling? Well, basketball's basketball not as bad yeah. as football. Football Plus, is yeah. where they really go out. You yeah. know, like Ohio State, for example, has games already scheduled 2022, 2023. Right, sure. yeah. Basketball, it's usually about three years out, but there's a lot more flexibility yeah. to throw in games, you know, into the next year. That being said, I'm a fan of it. I'm not a fan of it. I think to an extent it is, you know, it is what it is. It's the nature of the non-conference beast and a power five, you know, a power five conference, a power five though, school. 110, That's their strength of schedule uh, yes. rating there. And if you look at some of those other power fives, they're more in the 60 range. So I, would like to, to I, 60. I would like to see maybe one or two little more marquee, maybe like a butler, an, a, an X, a UC, mm -hmm. something in state of those regards. But I do like the marquee home, marquee away, and that usually happens with the ACC Big Ten Challenge. This weekend, obviously, with Carolina on the schedule, no matter how good or how bad Carolina is, Carolina is Carolina. Hmm. And, you know, that's a marquee basketball program in this country. And, you know, who knows what will happen on Saturday when those two meet up. But I do like the idea of maybe one more mm -hmm. semi-marquee or at least something that's got a little sizzle to it. Yeah meaning somebody in state that's a mid-major power or a team like a Butler out of the Big East. Here's the downside, and a lot of coaches do this, obviously, and, the, and they find willing opponents who want to play big, big-name schools. Right. The problem is once you get into your conference schedule, that's when you start preparing for the tournament. But is that enough? Don't, is it better to, you know, don't you want to have some games early on where you can really test your team, find out what you have? And I think that's some of the criticism that goes against having a schedule like with a bunch of Bad Mata has always said he is a believer in learning by winning. You win games early, you get into that groove early, and that carries you on. Whereas if you lose a couple games early, team chemistry can explode on you and, mm -hmm. and nothing quite happens. Even if they're difficult games? Absolutely. 
All right. Well, that's Thad Mata's coaching strategy. I don't know if I agree with Thad Mata, yeah. but Thad. Agree to disagree on this end as well, but we'll, we'll leave it at that. So the NBA now, the Cavaliers, a little bit two, two-faced here early on. They won eight straight, and then they've lost two of three now more recently. Which team should we expect going forward? Is this a dominant Cavs team, or is this more a 500 Cavs team? 14 to 9 coming into a, us taping the show here. It does seem like they have kind of found their way a little bit. Um, the other night, it was, you know, I think it was good for them against Charlotte to get out like they did. They started out 19 nothing, extended it 23-2, but Charlotte, to their credit, came right back, and they test them, made it a little bit more interesting. I think the game was an 11-point win or something like that for Cleveland. I think what we're seeing now is what we're going to see the rest of the way. They're going to have games where they may hiccup. I think that they'll have games where they'll do very well. They may blow out some teams, especially some of the lower-tier teams in the Eastern Conference, such as Philadelphia, such as Detroit and the like there and Orlando coming up and you know they still have Miami on Christmas Day yep. which you know in Miami it's going to be interesting that's going to be very interesting <laughs> for and the Mi 14 fans that show up <laughs> yes wearing all white and leave after the third quarter that's right but um it will be very interesting that game because which Miami team will they face Miami's a team that's been a roller coaster this year and we'll see how that progresses but I think for the most part what we're seeing with, with the Cavaliers right now is what we're going to get they're going to They'll be in the top three, four, I think, you know, when it's all said and done in the Eastern Conference. I think when you look at the Cavs, to me it goes back to the fact you've got a rookie head coach. Now, mm -hmm. you, you can say that head coaches, particularly in the NBA, particularly on this team, aren't as important. But when you've got a guy going through the league for the very first time, that's going to be an inconsistency. I, I, I think we're going to see the Cavaliers – they're going to go on these streaks, but I, I think they are going to go on some losing streaks as well. I, I think you're right, Aaron. You're going to look at probably a top four finish in the conference. It's all going to depend upon what happens in May, which is what matters in the NBA. I think you're going to see more of that dominant Cavs team come about if and when they become more consistent on defense. Because that's really where, if you look at the, the times where they've really struggled, the defense has been just abysmal at some, some moments. And so that's a, and then there's the bench factor, which has not performed like first year head coach has wanted to. Um, and so don't forget that they've got a trade situation, possibilities coming up. Uh, and yes, they've they got a couple situations. A couple of those yeah. things. You talk about those. There's the talk of Dion Waiters being mm -hmm. moved. There's the talk of Ray Allen maybe coming in as a free agent signee, which they'll have to create a roster spot there. So there, I think that they will be players um, in in the chess game of mm -hmm. the what is the NBA trade world, um, but. We'll see what happens. But I think that there will be probably one move, whether it's Allen signing, whether it's Waiters moving, getting moved on as well, because it seems like there is some discord in that regard. There. Well, and you, Sean Marion has played more than they had anticipated. Yes. Which has forced LeBron to play more minutes than they had anticipated. And so that whole situation there, I think, needs some sort of correction. Yep. Bowl season starts Saturday. Which non-playoff football game are we most looking forward to? And I know for me, I think it's the one that Todd is at. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Todd Walker with the Bowling Green Falcons. BG, South Alabama, the Camellia Bowl. I like that matchup um, for the Falcons, but they, they're a team that's been in disarray. They've lost three games. They had um, a player who plays a lot of, you know, played a lot of snaps, get arrested. He's not making the trip with the team. I like the matchup between USC and Nebraska. Yeah. I think that's an intriguing matchup. How does Nebraska rally after losing Coach Bo Pelini? How does USC rally, you know, do coming off of a dominating win over Notre Dame in their last regular season game? Do they carry that momentum forward into next year? Another game that I'm really looking forward to is Notre Dame LSU in the Music City Bowl on the 30th, and that's an afternoon game. And, you know, same thing with Notre Dame. They're reeling right now, LSU. You know, they've been a disappointment by their standards, a team that was, you know, in the top 10 at one point this year that kind of fell off the radar a little bit. But I also think, and I think maybe you have this one as well, Mark, Sparty and Baylor. Yeah. Sparty and Baylor is going to be rock em, sock em. Those are the two teams that probably have, the, with yeah. the exception of TC, have the biggest gripe about not getting into the playoffs. Mm -hmm. If they'd expanded it to eight, those are two of the teams you always hear about. But uh, you have to see how Michigan State is going to respond going down to Texas to take on Baylor in their home state. The other game I'm really looking forward to because of the Big Ten ties, seeing how Wisconsin yes. battles back yeah. with their head coach situation. Paul Chris expected to be named the new head coach, but Barry Alvarez will be the one calling the shots. And 
Some have intimated that Barry Alvarez has been calling all the shots for the last six years, which is why they've had two coaches leave for lateral jobs. Mm -hmm. But I think the interesting thing about this playoff season, this bowl season, is there's a lot of changes to the schedule. How is that going to affect people's watching habits? You, you mentioned that LSU-Notre Dame game being an afternoon game on a Tuesday. You've got some big bowls on New Year's Eve night. I know last year down in Miami, the vibe we picked up, picked up for some of the Orange Bowl folks were they weren't real happy about the Orange Bowl going to New Year's Eve night, right. thinking that there's going to be people out. They're not going to be home watching those bowl games. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And then, of course, New Year's Day, you got the playoff games. Those will rate... Well, I'm sure just based, you know, based yep. on what's on the yep. line. Yeah, and those aren't till 5 o'clock with right. the Rose Bowl, but you've got the Cotton Bowl and you've got mm -hmm. the Citrus Bowl, yep. which has M Mizzou in it. Those two games. Mizzou-Minnesota is another interesting matchup. It yeah. is, and I also think um, TCU as yeah. well. And there's, they're going to be out to prove a point as well, saying, hey, that we belonged as well. But 35, bowl ga or, you know, seven, 35 games, 70 teams. Some of these teams have no business being there. <laughs> <coughs> Illinois. <coughs> <laughs> um, seven wins needs to be the bowl eligible. And if you do that, you're not going to have enough bowl eligible teams. I know. But with only one game on last Saturday, I was craving a little college football. So I think that people will find the games just because they want to watch college football. So. And BG plays at 9 o'clock. So yeah. you can go to your high school game <laughs> and then flip on, get home, watch ESPN, or listen to it on uh, 940 WCIT. And speaking of <laughs> Army Navy, what a quick turnaround for Navy. They play this Saturday, yeah. last Saturday, and yeah. they've only got like 10 days, and yeah. then they play their bowl game. Yep, they're in the Poinsettia Bowl on next Tuesday night. Yeah. Well, gonna be fun to watch it all play out. Thanks for joining us on Press Row, and we'll see you in 2015. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year.